Okay, so my talk um, is going to be, I think, fairly complementary to the one that Vic gave uh, before me. His was mostly optic-centered, and mine is going to be somewhat more uh, HCI and user interface for AR-centered. Um, in order to uh, give a talk that talks about the future in an intro track, I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of the terms that we're using. And so I'm going to start uh, in defining AR by defining VR, at least the way that researchers like me like to think of it. So we think of VR as being essentially a computer-generated world of virtual media. Uh, that is 3D, which of course encompasses 2D things as well. That's interactive and that is tracked in terms of position and orientation relative to the user. Now, important thing about the definition I just gave you, I didn't say anything about seeing anything or about anything necessarily being visual. VR can refer to essentially any and or all of your senses. And as we'll see, we can do the same thing with AR. So it doesn't have to be only something that you see. So here we have our uh, classical little fish-mouthed uh, uh, Oculus Rift-wearing person. And we go from VR to AR, basically it's all of the above, except the material, the virtual material, is registered in 3D with the perceptible real world. So that's AR. Again, not necessarily visual, appealing to all of your senses, even in literally including things that you taste and smell and feel. So I just use two names and I give you definitions. It turns out there's lots and lots of names. This is the classic thing that happens in a world of research that then turns into a world of marketing. So in 1968, as uh, Ori uh, alluded to this morning, was the first published paper uh, on uh, VR and A AR by Adam Sutherland. And he referred to what he was doing with a rather prosaic name, head-mounted three-dimensional display. Not exactly a marketing person, but he was a faculty member, so he's not supposed to be a marketing person. We have some 24 years that passed before Tom Cridell and Dave Mizell, then at Boeing, coined the term augmented reality, which we often abbreviate AR, to refer to the idea of mixing together virtual things with real things. Two years later, Paul Milgram and Fumio Kishino uh, come up with the term mixed reality, or MR, uh, that they're used to refer to a continuum that goes all the way from AR, in which the idea is now they're emphasizing you're augmenting reality. It's mostly reality, you're adding some virtual stuff. And on the other end is a phrase that you'll hear very few people, except for researchers who like it, and there are not all that many who do, augmented virtuality, which is mostly virtual stuff with some real stuff added to it. 1997, Steve Mann makes a very astute observation that we're talking about augmenting stuff, and sometimes we really aren't augmenting it, we're mediating it. Maybe I let you see someone's shirt in a different color. Is that really adding? No, that's, maybe that's not really adding, that's changing, okay? Maybe I take their image and I make it thinner or make them uh, look like they weigh more, or make them look like they're uh, from another planet by maybe changing their body shape a little bit, but not really augmenting. On the other hand, maybe you wanna get, we wanna get rid of something. So I wanna look at the carpet and not see a big ugly stain that's on it. So that's maybe not so much augmenting, but diminishing. So the term diminished reality gets used. So a number of years pass, 1997 to 2015, and the marketing folks at Microsoft decide they're going to redefine mixed reality. So this is a marketing-driven redefinition, not one that normally would come out of a researcher. And the idea is to make it sound better than AR, because AR, after all, is just kind of like putting a sort of planar overlay of stuff on top of things. You don't really mix together the virtual and real, do you? Well, the answer is that's a bunch of uh, a load, shall we say. Um, but when you have a powerful marketing machine, you can then try to redefine the term in people's minds. Um, and a number of people here will use it that way. This is not the way that researchers use it, however. A year later, along comes Intel. They like to do the same thing. They can't use the term mixed reality because Microsoft is using it a lot. That would not look good. So to avoid sounding like Microsoft, they decide to call things merged reality, okay? So many researchers, myself included, use AR for all of the above. And yes, we'll admit that, of course, if you're diminishing, you're not necessarily adding, but you could, of course, see diminishing as adding the stuff that covers up, like the coffee stain that's really the color of the rug. Um, 
but most of us just don't really care that much about those nuances, some of which, as I said, are completely artificial. And then just to make things all kinds of fun, we now have the term XR that people are often using, which simply uses X for pretty much any of those uh, letters that comes before R. So AR, MR, VR, it's all XR. Um, well, I think that sort of throws out some of the really useful distinctions, but you will hear people using it. And so again, you will hear people who will tell you that some of the things I just said are wrong. I've been doing it longer than they have, and I'm right. <laughs> you can send them to me and I'll try to uh, educate them. So let me tell you a little bit about how these displays work. Very, very high level. I'm going to show you abstract images of things. So we'll start with what is called optical see-through. Now we're concentrating on visual AR. I was trying before not to be visually chauvinistic. A lot of stuff that we do is visual. People talk about smart glasses, for example. Um, and so these definitions are all visually oriented. Optical see-through simply means there is a display, often opaque. You are looking at it through optics, which often are some combination of lenses and or mirrors. The combination gets done in the optics, and a really simple example would literally be a piece of glass at an angle. You look through it, and reflected at a 90 degrees might be a display that's above it. If you coat the glass correctly, you can get more or less of the display versus what you see in the world. And of course, the world should be bright enough to compete with the display. All the combination being done entirely in optics. Well, you also have video see-through. One or more, nowadays typically two cameras. The camera images are combined together in the computer with the virtual graphics that you'd like to add to it. Um, and as we know, there's all kinds of wonderful things we can do and nowadays in real time. Uh, to be able to make sure that we see just the camera image at a pixel or just the virtual stuff or some really cool combination. Pretty much anything we'd like to, the sky's the limit because it's all done with computer graphics and fast hardware. And then finally, we have projection in which instead of combining in optics or combining in the computer, we can literally combine in the world by projecting stuff with a projector, spraying pixels into the world. If we spray them in the right place and they're the right color, um, we can end up making things look like they're there that really aren't there. This is an extraordinarily simple, I wouldn't really normally call this uh, AR version of taking an otherwise, we hope, pretty much white screen and turning it into a display by just projecting right on top of it um, in a nice, very, very simple way. But not interesting enough to normally be called AR. Okay, so one more thing. These are abstract pictures. Um, I'm in the pictures not committing to the size or position or orientation of any of those parts. So the display can in all of it or in part of it be worn, for example, on your head. Um, it could be held, for example, in your hand as in uh, smartphone based AR. Um, and it could also be in the environment, in which there might be some nice, big, chunky thing that lives at some tourist site in which you might look through what look like binoculars, but actually uh, have the optics in them to combine, let's say, virtual overlays on top of what you see in the real world. So this is the basic set of things you can do, sort of a cross product of three different approaches times three different ways in which we can actually have the parts dispersed um, on your person or in the environment. So having said that, let me just give you sort of a, my understanding, my take on why we think this stuff is really important. Why AR? The image I'm showing you over here I took in my hotel room last night. It shows a Roman statue of uh, the god of war Mars um, in my hotel room. Um, you know, if you looked at it really carefully and you knew something about graphics or about you know, the way light works with the environment, you'd probably notice the illumination isn't quite correct in terms of the lights that are in the environment. But other than that, at first glance, it probably looks pretty reasonable. Um, make this something that is life-size if it's really big, or again, life-size if it's really small. You can walk around it. You can manipulate it in, in your hand. And those are very, very powerful things. This is from the BBC Civilizations AR app. And it actually has a mode where you can simply have it display on the screen. And despite the fact the image is really going to be the same size, much more powerful. You know how to go around to the back of this statue and look at it. You don't have to ask about the user interface. If I displayed the statue on the screen, there's a lot of different UIs that you could use 
with just touch screens alone to be able to get to the back of the statue, okay? And if this, instead of being in my uh, um, uh, hotel room, were let's say something I was kind of holding in my hand and I wanted to look at its helmet, I know from having been literally trained as a little baby on, on up, I simply go like this and I can instantly look at the top. Nothing needs to be said about the user interface. That said, however, you know, you can do this in VR as well. That statue has no business in my hotel room. It has nothing to do with a hotel room. It's simply there. It actually looks like it's on the floor, but it really doesn't have any meaning in terms of the room itself. Okay? It's just a matter of convenience. So we can up the ante a little bit and go to the idea of now experiencing things in the context of the real world, paying attention to the real world, trying to basically maintain our situational awareness while we're doing something. In this case, this is an old game that we did a while ago in which you're holding in your hand a little computer that's kind of like a smartphone, a slider smartphone on steroids for the time. You're tapping away at the screen, shooting balls at virtual dominoes, virtual balls, virtual dominoes, all of which are tracked by this array of black and white markers. And by doing this, you can pay attention to the other person that you're playing with. You could even look up and see them, okay? And so it really does matter that they're there in the environment, unlike that experience with that uh, Roman sculpture. Here's another one. This is a system that we're doing that's running on HoloLens. Um, this is actually used um, in uh, patient procedures, vascular interventions. And the physician performing the operation is looking at this case at a patient-specific model of anatomy. The anatomy is not where the patient is. They're threading a catheter up to the patient's uh, vasculature. It doesn't need to be where the body part that they're targeting actually is because they haven't actually cut the patient open at that part. And so in this case, they're looking at a convenient place where that model can be. Um, they need to be aware of the world in which they're in. There's a person lying on that uh, table in front of them, and there are other people that they're working with, but the augmentation itself simply needs to be stable in the environment. And let's up the ante one more time. Now we can actually integrate the real and virtual worlds, like this, uh, an application for being able to look at furniture, for example, in place. And here, the furniture really needs to be where I put it. This is one that's using a marker on the floor. If you did this with AR Core, AR Kit, it would probably drift around a little bit. And you know that having your furniture move around by even a couple of inches, if you're trying to figure out if it fits, is probably not a good idea. Another example, this is a maintenance and repair uh, system that my students and I had worked on, in which you're seeing overlay graphics explaining how to perform a task. Uh, again, tightly integrated with the stuff that it's talking about. In this case, combustion chamber for an aircraft engine. Um, here's an outdoor scenario. We're walking along uh, Broadway in New York, and we're seeing a little uh, information sheet about Tom's restaurant with a little leader line pointing to the restaurant itself, and the sheet staying out of the way so it doesn't block your view of it, okay? Again, really important where it is relative to the things that are in the environment. So that's kind of like my overview of the sort of intro. And what I want to do right now is really talk about essentially what I think is next. And there's a wonderful quote, which uh, is usually accredited to, to William Gibson, um, that a URL at the bottom it seems to be the definitive source of exactly when he said this. Apparently never was actually in anything he wrote, but it's in a lot of, uh, in various versions in, in uh, talks that he uh, gave and shows that he appeared on. Um, and it's kind of interesting watching how that quote matures over the years. And what the quote basically is saying is the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And I think a really good example of that um, with different versions of the future, uh, a much more distant one and a much less distant one, um, uh, can be had looking back some nearly 50 years ago at a very important event, the Full Joint Computer Conference of 1968. And at that conference, Doug Engelbart and his crew gave what usually gets referred to as the mother of all demos, in which they were doing video conferencing. That's him up on the screen over there. They were using this newfangled thing called a mouse that pretty much most of the people who were at the demo had never ever seen before. You know, this basically was presaging all the things that people, not all that many years later, were doing with their workstations and then later desktop 
computers. Interestingly, at that very same conference, within a matter of hours of that live demo, it was a not live demo, but a talk, rather, by Ivan Sutherland on that head-tracked, head-mounted 3D display, which essentially introduced um, head-tracked VR and AR with very simple graphics. It was 50 years ago, right? And you see an example of that line-drawn, no hidden lines removed cube, uh, typical of what you could actually generate with this system in stereo. Interestingly, with a head-worn display that doesn't look horribly different from a lot of the ones that people actually produce as dev kits right now, although it used CRTs, and you're not seeing the computer that it's hooked up to, which is much, much bigger than anything we would use right now. So that said, what I want to do is to talk a little bit in the remaining time about my take on the things that are coming next. They're here to some extent and not here to the extent that we actually want them. One of them is collaboration. You'll see a number of folks here talking about doing collaboration in AR uh, or AR and VR, um, both of people who are co-located physically in the same place and people who might be in different locations. One example of that that's a great interest to my lab and me is remote task assistance, where there is essentially a uh, uneven, asymmetric relationship between someone who's really where the task needs to get done, boots on the ground, so to speak, typically someone who's younger, uh, less skilled than the more expert person who is remote and who is going to be assisting them. And so this is a demo that we actually gave at SIGGRAPH last year with a local technician wearing a Meta 2 optical see-through display and our remote SME, subject matter expert, um, in VR. Um, lower latency, that's going to be really important. Um, uh, uh, Vic, I think, referred to um, 5G before. This is actually work that we're doing with Verizon using an experimental 5G installation they have. Uh, it, a virtual marble platform, a virtual ball, two virtual ropes uh, attached to two corners uh, on the hands of one user, another user on the other side holding their virtual ropes. And then with very low latency, People on different machines can essentially really control that ball, bounce it up in the air. This is governed by uh, physics of the, uh, the kind that you'll find in the Unity uh, graphics uh, system. Um, and it takes a fair amount of skill to be able to keep that ball bouncing around like that and not falling. And you can actually exert that skill because the latency is so low. You don't really feel like you've been cheated. So we're going to see more and more of that being able to be done. That was in VR, of course, not AR. Greater mobility. Um, my lab has since the uh, late 90s been using what was then an extremely expensive kind of global navigation satellite system, um, GNSS, which is the generic for what the US GPS constellation is. There's a Russian GLONASS constellation. Um, there's a several other constellations that are more or less uh, global right now and some of the ones that are not are going to be over the next couple of years. Uh, so right now, your phone probably can receive and uses both the US and Russian constellations. You probably at best will see maybe 10 feet, something like that, often a lot worse. There are chips coming out that will go down to around one foot that will probably be in phones this year or next year. Um, and the kind that we're using uses error correction to be able to get down with a local uh, error correcting base station to around one inch as you walk around updating at 20 hertz. And so in this case, we're looking on the right. You can see over here through HoloLens um, at an information sheet about some campus security cameras. Um, one other important thing, head-worn displays, I think, are a lot of where things are going to be going. Um, as opposed to phones that you have to pull out of your holster out of your pocket and hold up and look around. Um, once you have something on your head, that means you can put other stuff there besides the display, like, for example, eye tracking. And there's wonderful uses for eye tracking for things ranging from foveated rendering, trying to do most of the rendering budget at the places you're really looking at directly, um, to 
user interfaces, knowing which way a person is looking, for example, and even, in fact, being able to tell how big their pupils are, which is an indication of how interested they are in something. Expression tracking, that same camera looking at your eyes or other cameras can be looking at your face and determining you know, what you think so far as looking at your face can do that. Brain-computer interfaces are also things that are going to be enabled by having the ability to put sensors really, really close to and touching, in fact, your head. Last thing I want to mention, and this is something that I mentioned actually in a talk I gave at the Augmented Reality event, which in 2010 was the forerunner of what is now, of course, AWE. Um, and that's that as we walk around outside, and we start wearing more and more cameras and microphones, and maybe we have a reason to want to give up the output of our cameras and microphones. Like, let's say there's some party that has a lot of data about places and what they look like and sound like, um, and if you start by knowing where you are within a matter of inches or even just 10 feet or so, and they have a really good model of what the environment looks like, they could take your camera image and they could figure out really precisely where you are, and at the same time they might answer a question you have, which is why you'll give it to them. And this sure sounds like Google. In fact, it sounds like what recently uh, Google announced as the visual positioning system, which would let you move your phone around outside that background image there is actually from a Google I.O. talk in which they're pointing out that now you can look around and really be precisely positioned. This is great stuff if you want to find out answers to questions like, you know, what are the good restaurants to eat at and other things like that. It's also a wonderful way for you as a walking sensor suite of ever and ever better sensors uh, to be convinced to part with your data to people who will, of course, update the world to serve you better, but will know lots, lots more stuff than they do right now. So if you're worried about Siri or Google Assistant or Alexa or whatever new ones will come along that simply listen in your house to your voice, um, now you've got something that will be listening and looking at everything that you're listening and looking at. And because it's eyewear and not just your phone, it's going to be on all the time. And that also means that if you're not in the house of someone with Alexa or Assistant or uh, Siri and you don't like those things, you're probably safe. But if you're walking around outside and uh, you're going to walk past people who have all of those things on and they're going to look at you and they're going to recognize your face from your Facebook post or from the fact that you've gone in and out of that same building pretty much every day for the past 10 years, so you probably live there, there's a lot of really interesting security issues. So I would like everyone to just think about some of those. You might decide it's worth it. You might decide it's not worth it. But you really need to think about it. Okay, thank you. <laughs>